and um, I what what I felt was that you know rather than doing this in twenty minutes with you know a textbook style lecture or you know just putting up a, a, a long video, uh, let me give you some key points that I've learned down the you know few years of doing orthognathic surgery. <clears throat> so I I would break it up into three parts. Um, uh, it's how do you make a correct diagnosis? How do you decide, you know, where the problem lies and, you know, how can you correct it? What will give the patient the best result with, you know, the least morbidity? The second is how do we do it, which is the surgery itself and the technical aspects. And the last is going to be about how do we make the surgery better or easy or more predictable or, you know, less morbid for the patient. Um, so starting off by, you know, talking about, you know, what are the options that we have? And uh, I think a lot of you will have seen this uh, scope of treatment di uh, diagram, which shows how much of movement we can do. And um, as we know, you know, the options we have are orthodontics. As you can see here, this lady has got a lot of crowded teeth. And <clears throat> if uh, we are to correct this only orthodontically, uh, we can straighten the teeth, but we can't really make a huge amount of movements of the teeth within the basal bone. Um, the other option we have is growth modification. And growth modification is probably a little bit uh, better in terms of, uh, you know, how much we can achieve. And you can see that, you know, uh, in, for this patient, we've got some reasonable amount of, you know, schedule correction with the growth uh, modification. Um, the next option we have is... Uh, um, orthognathic surgery, and um, we can make huge changes to patients' faces with orthognathic surgery, as you can see here for this patient. And finally, we have distraction, which I think you've already spoken about. And uh, I think, uh, you know, th that has probably got the maximum amount of mobility, but, you know, it has its own challenges, which we can discuss maybe when we are talking about this in the discussion. So, um, uh, what is the so for when we when we look at a patient uh, with a deformity, first of all, what we need to do is decide where uh, what is the cause. Is there anything that we need to be aware of in terms of the etiology of this? And for most patients, where there is a really a lot that we can do about the etiology, a lot of times it's genetic. Uh, patients may be having, for example, clefts, as you saw this patient who's got hemifacial microsomia. Uh, this patient who has hemiatrophy, there isn't a lot that we can do in terms of treating the actual etiology. But sometimes when uh, facial deformities occur, like in this patient who has a hemiatrophy <clears throat> uh, following an injury which he had as a child, uh, there are things that we can do to treat the etiology itself. So that's something that we need to be aware of. Uh, coming to then the assessment of the patient and uh, <clears throat> what we... Um, need to do is analyze the patient scientifically, objectively, so that we don't miss anything out. So <clears throat> uh, as I tell my trainees, uh, look at patients in terms of, you know, uh, thirds and fifths to so divide the patient's face into different parts and try to figure out where the problem lies. And for example, this patient, you can see if we draw three lines, divide the face into three parts, it's pretty obvious that the lower third of the face, there is a problem that the patient has. Um, and this can... <clears throat> be further divided into two uh, thirds and one thirds. And again, that helps us analyze this better. So this lady, again, we can see that we've divided the lower third. And what she was unhappy was that she felt her lower, she had a very short face. And we can see that the lower part of her face, she has quite large lips, uh, but the chin is uh, not in balance with that. And this is simply with uh, a genioplasty that this lady has had an improvement. We can see the, how the balance of the face changes. So looking at the patient in two thirds and thirds is a good way of uh, uh, deciding, you know, where the problem lies. Again, we need to look at a patient in all three planes. Um, so we need to look at them transversely as well. And occasionally we'll have patients, especially patients who are syndromic, who may be having some imbalance. Telecanth, as you can see here in a Crozon's patient, this patient who has, uh, you know, again, a syndrome and uh, has got hy uh, uh, hypertelorism and telecanthus as well. So these are things that we shouldn't be missing out. Uh, we then look at the soft tissues over the face. And as you can see here, this patient has a problem with the competence of her lips. Um, <clears throat> this patient, on the other hand, uh, doesn't show enough teeth. And uh, that's 
pretty obvious even from the frontal pictures, even though I haven't got the profile views, that she has a deficient maxilla. Um, we then need to focus on areas like the chin, especially if you're looking at the mandible and confirm that the mandible, the teeth and the chin are in alignment. And you can see here that the midline of the teeth doesn't coincide with the chin. So this patient does have an asymmetry. Um, there are certain tools that help us analyze uh, the patient better, looking at the nasolabial angle, as you can see here, uh, which we've improved by doing a bimaxillary uh, surgery for this patient. Uh, looking at the lip, chin, and throat angle. So you can see here, this lady had a deficient chin. And by advancing the chin, doing a genioplasty augmentation, uh, we've improved the chin balance and we've improved the uh, lip, chin, throat angle for her. Um, so when we look at a patient, we need to uh, uh, have some records, both from a point of view of treatment analysis and also from a medical legal point of view. So the minimum set would be some frontal pictures like this in smiling and not at uh, rest and a lateral profile view as well. And then some views of the dentition because these are the things that we are going to work on. Um, now, uh, there are lots of various cephalometric analysis that, uh, which are available. Um, I think they are an adjunctive tool but I wouldn't take them as gospel. And I don't think you, know, you need to treat the patient only on the basis of cephalometrics, but it is a useful tool again in analyzing where the problem lies on the patient. And these are just you know, the various uh, you know, analysis for this patient. And uh, you know, based on this, we can tell that this patient has got a bimaxillary protrusion. She's also got a deficient chin. And these are the things that we can improve. Now, <clears throat> nowadays we do have various softwares available, which does help in analyzing this in more detail. Dolphin is one of them. Uh, Nemofab, which we have uh, in our institute is another one. And uh, these nowadays in 3D can analyze the patient and give us an idea of what movements will produce what changes. Again, I would use these with a little caution uh, because they are useful tools, but they're not accurate. So we still haven't reached that accuracy where we can predict what the patient is going to look like. Um, so once we've decided where the deformity is, we have to decide about treatment options for the patient. And we have basically four options. Orthodontic camouflage, growth modification, which means functional appliances, uh, orthodontic surgery, include in, uh, along with orthodontics, and distraction. Now, uh, certain patients may not be keen on surgery, and you know we have to accept that uh, as you know because the patient is the one who is going to have you know the treatment done. Um, <clears throat> if it is a borderline case where you know there's minimal <clears throat> uh, skeletal changes, we can make some movements uh, with uh, uh, ortho orthodontics. We can intrude teeth. Um, and uh, <clears throat> if the patient, again, is not motivated for treatment, it's probably better not to do surgery because surgery comes with its own morbidity as well. Um, <clears throat> remember that there are certain movements which cannot be done orthodontically. So this lady actually had had orthodontics and she was unhappy with the final result because she has a very gummy smile. She has vertical maxillary excess. And this is her after having orthodontic surgery and you can see she's much happier with the result uh, so things like intrusion of the maxilla, large movements of the teeth, particularly bodily movements of the teeth, uh, we have to explain to the patient that these things cannot be done orthodontically, and it has to be done, you know, with surgery. Um, growth modification or uh, functional appliance, if the patient is identified early, can be used sometimes to re uh, reduce the need for surgery. So things like a chin cap can sometimes be used to help uh, reorient uh, the growth of certain structures like the mandible. Um, uh, the problem is that, you know, often, you know, growth modification is often very prolonged and the patients get tired of the treatment, they're not compliant. And sometimes they still require surgery because it's very difficult to control facial growth. Um, the other option that we have is distraction. And again, distraction is useful in large movements which may be unstable and relapse might be higher if you do it with orthognathic surgery. It's also useful for unfavorable movements. For example, if you're trying to pull the maxilla down vertically, it's, uh, or if you're trying to extrude the mandible, 
um, increase the length of the posterior mandible. These things can't be done very easily with surgery. Uh, we're working against muscles, but because soft tissue growth happens along with osteopathic surgery, these are better done with the distraction. So here is just an example. This patient needed a 20 millimeter advancement of the mandible and 20 millimeters is a lot to do on the table with osteopathic surgery. So this lady, we did a, we placed a distractor and uh, we use this. Now the cuts for a distraction are slightly different and the distractor has to be placed in the mouth for about three months. So the, the, these are things that we have to warn the patient about that they will have to go through the discomfort of having an appliance in the mouth for three months plus the surgery. Um, and sometimes the movement vectors can be a little unpredictable. So this patient, when we went back to take off the distractor, the I mean, distractor plates were completely embedded in bone. We couldn't take them out. So these are certain things which are unpredictable when we are doing distraction. So these are certain factors that we have to consider. Now, uh, if we decide that orthognathic surgery is the way for the patient, uh, we need to determine what are the facial goals. Are we going to advance the maxilla? Are we, are we going to uh, set back the mandible by how many millimeters? All of this has to be planned before the, uh, before the orthodontic starts. And what are the dental goals? So what position are we going to put the teeth in? Now, from experience of other patients, we know that certain movements will cause certain types of facial changes. For example, this patient we can see has had an advancement of the mandible. And we can see that by advancing the mandible, we increase the lower facial height. We reduce the vermilion show. We reduce the labiomental fold and we improve the chin. Uh, we also improve the chin prominence in profile and uh, give the patient uh, uh, increased lip fullness. Um, similarly, if we're doing a mandible, a setback, we know that the changes that this patient will have will be uh, less prominence of the lower lip, more prominence of the upper lip, a reduction in the facial height, and uh, things like you know reduction in the chin throat angle again. Uh, but sometimes patients can end up with excessive submental tissue, which can be a problem and which something might need to be done to be deal with this. Now, I'm going to cover only two surgical techniques, uh, the BSSO, the uh, sagittal split, and the genioplasty, because these are probably the two most common procedures that we do in the mandible in more detail. Um, so the, uh, the BSSO uh, is a very versatile osteotomy for making changes to the mandible. Um, it's, we usually do it through an incision in the third molar region. If the wisdom tooth isn't present, then it's an incision going behind the second molar and going up laterally towards the cheek. And the po uh, posterior part of the incision is just slightly longer than that for a wisdom tooth because we're trying to expose the coronoid process. And the reason why we need to expose the coronoid process is we want exposure on the lingual side. So once we've exposed the coronoid, we retract the tissues on the lingual side in order for us to see the lingula. So the lingula is the first thing that we identify. And hopefully on this photograph, which you can see on the top right hand side, uh, you may just be able to see the lingula. And there's a periosteal editor which is just being kept uh, below the lingula and retracting the nerve so that when we make our lingual cut, we don't damage this nerve. So the cut is made uh, just behind the link, up to a point just behind the lingula. This is the Hansak Dalpont modification. We don't do it all the way to the back. And this gives us a shorter uh, split to make and makes it more predictable. Um, so once this cut is done, and I think this cut is actually fairly straightforward. Once you identify the lingula, or learn to identify the lingual. Making the lingual cut isn't that difficult. Uh, you can do it with a burr. You can do it with a saw. A reciprocating saw is a good way of doing it as well. The lower border osteotomy is the next thing that we do. So we, ident we expose the lower border only in the area of the first and second molar. Remember, we don't want to strip the mandible all the way on the buccal side because the blood supply to this segment of the bone is primarily going to come from the blood mass that are attached in the the angle region. We never strip this area. Um, now, people always think about the damage of the nerve in the lingular side, but actually the majority of uh, cuts in the uh, nerve that I have seen are usually while doing the lower border osteotomy. 
So when you're making this buckle cut and making a lower border osteotomy, you need to be careful that you go only through the buckle cortex. So you go only about two or three millimeters into the depth of the cortex, and that's how thick the mandible is usually in this area. Nowadays with CBCTs, we can predict where the nerve is, but particularly in patients with a class three mandible, there can be a lot of curvature of the mandible in this area and the nerve can be sitting inside the buccal cortex and there is a chance of damaging the nerve here. So you need to be careful. Um, piezo is a good way of making this cut and I think it probably does reduce the incidence of damage to the nerve. Um, once you've made this cut, we then make the uh, uh, joining osteotomy or the connecting of the cut between the two. So this is done either over the uh, retromandible region, or if there is a wisdom tooth present, then we take the wisdom tooth out and make it in this area. Um, if the wisdom tooth is present, it can sometimes lead to certain challenges. The lingual bone may be quite thin, and it can increase the risk of uh, osteo of uh, bad splits. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, so once our three cuts are done. Uh, we then start uh, tapping our mandible. And there are two ways, again, of opening up the split. Uh, I prefer to do it with a, a set of uh, osteotomes. I guess it's, that's how I was trained. So I use a large osteotome first in the retromolar region and a smaller one at the lower border. And then I gradually open up the osteotomy uh, from the front and then keep pro pro proceeding posteriorly. Now, when you're tapping the osteotome, what you should see is that the whole split from the buccal to the lingual should be opening up together. If you find that it's opening up anteriorly and not opening up posteriorly, you know that there's some uh, bone holding on the lingual side and you probably need to tap through the lingual bone again first before we can complete your osteotomy. Um, the other way which you can do it which is with a um, spreader, with a Smith spreader. And uh, my colleague Kumar likes to do it with a spreader. And I'll show you both ways because they both work. Now, with both of these, the important thing is when the osteotome which you're keeping at the upper border is used, you have to twist it to open up the osteotomy. It's very important that you always put the pressure on the lingual side of the bone, not on the buccal side, and that will reduce the chances of a bad buccal split. So uh, here is a little video showing you how you open up the split using an osteotome. So uh, we start pushing on the osteotome, twist the osteotome against the lingual bone. And what we should see is the whole osteotomy from the buccal to the lingual opening up in one go. That tells us that uh, we are through. And once we've got sufficient mobility, then I would go to a Smith spreader and again, gently open it up so that I can see where the nerve is. Now, if the nerve is on the lingual side, as you can see here in the split, that's where it's supposed to be. Sometimes, unfortunately, the nerve is sitting in the buccal plate, and then you need to carefully tease the nerve out of the buccal plate so that it is transferred over to the correct side before you complete your split. Once your split is complete, and again, just a little video showing you um, what we need to do is open up the split completely until you can see the lower border. So you should be able to see the periosteum at the lower border and also uh, the pterygomandibular musculature posteriorly. And what we then do is use a large periosteal, like an obvigesal, as, as is being shown here, to stretch the musculature. So this is being done in the split region to release the periosteal attachments to the two structures. Uh, only then will we be able to mobilize the mandible. So once we've sufficiently mobilized the two segments, we basically got the mandible into three pieces, two attached to the individual condyles, one with the dental uh, uh, apparatus attached, and we can then check that we have free movement of the, of the three. Um, we then set the mandible to the planned position, and by keeping an instrument against the lower border of the proximal segments, that is the condylar bearing segment, we can confirm that it's seated in the condyle, um, we then uh, fix the mandible uh, while fixing. I think one of the important things is to make sure that the lower border is a, a, in continuity on, on both sides. So here you can see the lower border of both the splits is in continuity. 
and that will, uh, as well as pushing posteriorly on the to see the condyle, will make sure that we avoid any condylar sag. Uh, so on the left, we can see fixation using mini plates. On the right, we can see positional screws. Uh, again, both are good ways of uh, fixing osteotomies. Uh, my preference is to use plates because if there is any flaring lingually, uh, it takes care of it, but some people do like to use positional screws. Um, we can also do subapical osteotomies. Occasionally when we're doing segmentals, we do a lower subapical osteotomy. And basically this osteotomy is uh, uh, done in the premolar region and uh, the blood, blood supply of the segment comes mostly from the gingiva and from the lingual tissues. I'm not going to go into the details of that. The other versatile technique that we have is a genioplasty. So again, you can see the amount of change that we can create with just a genioplasty for a patient. And we can do it either as an augmentation or a reduction, uh, depending on what is required. Uh, it can also be done, used for asymmetry correction, as you can see here. Um, again, um, fixation can be done with plates. I'll also show you some genioplasty plates, or it can be done using a lag screw. So on the right, you can see a screw which is passing through um, the uh, uh, chin, engaging bone on the dental segment, and one or two lag screws is also a good way of holding the bone in position. Now, uh, there are tools that we have now which do, do make our osteotomies more predictable. So here is a chap who um, has, needs a bimaxillary surgery. You can see he's got a deficient maxilla. He's got a slightly prominent mandible. And it's these the movements are very, very small, but they're significant enough to make changes to the patient's face. And here we've done planning in 3D. So we've got a scone beam CT of the patient. We've scanned the models of the teeth and we've put them together. And we now uh, do the movements virtually. So uh, the maxilla is coming down, it's coming forwards, and the mandible is being set back. All of this is done virtually. And usually we sit down with the uh, uh, designers to do this. And once we're happy with the movements, uh, we then ask them to create a splint. And we use these splints as a guide at the time of the surgery to position the uh, jaws into. Uh, for genioplasties, they can also give us cutting guides. So here is again a guide which we used to position the uh, uh, chin and you know very predictably we can get the chin in exactly the position where we want using 3D planning. Now what are finally, uh, what are the things which can go wrong? So I think the biggest thing that everyone fears is you know having a bad split and you can see here if there's a wisdom tooth present, often the bone in the retromolar region is quite thin and chances of having an unpredictable split, particularly here, you can see lingually um, is a problem. So if you get a short lingual split like this, um, you may need to uh, use, uh, 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 do a second osteotomy to separate the uh, proximal segment from the badly split lingula. And you can see here from the cut there that we've had to use two plates now, one to fix the lingual broken bone and one to again reposition the remainder of the osteotomy. But uh, most of the time in this situation, you can complete the osteotomy and uh, uh, the patient can still get a good result. The other thing which can happen is while uh, uh, trying to open up the split, if you have insufficient mobility of the cuts, you can break the buccal bone. And this is a much more serious problem because if you've broken the buccal bone, completing the split becomes much more difficult. Um, also then the bone to which you have, you can provide fixation is uh, not so good. Uh, there's less bone apposition. And you have two options over here, basically to stop and say, okay, we're going to abandon the osteotomy. But uh, although that's, you know, in, in theory sounds like the best option, um, these patients are, have had, are having surgery for cosmetic reasons. And it's very difficult to convince the patient in my experience to have a second surgical procedure done. So if you can complete the procedure with minimal mobility, what we usually do is uh, do a vertical ramus osteotomy, uh, carefully split it. And again, a piezo is a fantastic tool to be able to complete this. It just means that very often you might need to put the patient into fixation with IMF for a little bit longer because your bony segments are not as stable. And you can use something like a long plate like this to stabilize the fragments. 
So here you can see um, it's not very, very clear, but we've got a bad buckle split there, and that's what we've had to do. Um, so I think that uh, completes uh, my uh, presentation on mandibular osteotomies. Um, I know it's been a quick uh, go through of the present of things, but I am happy to take any questions which anyone may have um, to talk about any of these techniques in more detail. Over to you, Taranjit. Do we have any questions? Or unless you want to put the questions at the end, um, I don't know if, if there are. Um, I have already requested that in case if anybody has questions, they can request to be unmuted and then we can ask them. Okay, but I could, uh, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Anjan, something that since you mentioned that most of these patients come for cosmetic reasons, it is very difficult to uh, convince them for second surgery or even explain the complication because that's yeah. the biggest problem with uh, elective surgeries and especially um, these kind of surgeries. And uh, so what do you think at the level of planning and, uh, you know, at the level of planning, is there something that we can do so that we have a better prepared patient in the OR so that, you know, when such a thing happens, uh, we have somebody who is more understanding of the situation. You think there's any possibility? Because I read some literature also that the expectations of these patients are very high uh, from the procedures. And so, so often, even if the whole procedure goes as per the plan, they're not really happy with the outcome. So how do we deal with that situation? So I think that is something. So, so I think, you know, uh, th there are three things here. One is uh, doing the, during the consultation process, you need to identify patients whose expectations are realistic and okay. patients whose expectations are unrealistic. And um, you know, a, a lot of patients do have unrealistic expectations. And uh, I think that's something which uh, you need to, uh, I guess it's something which probably comes with experience. I, I'm sure Sri John will probably say the same, but- Yes, you know, I wanted to know um, his views we, on we've this. We've all burnt situation. our fingers on patients yeah. who've, uh, you know, yeah. who've promised certain things, or, you know, they, you know, think that this is what they're going to look like. You know, they say, oh, I'm going to come back and I'm going to look like Madhuri Dikshit or Raishwari yes. Rai, you know, yeah. this yeah. Yeah. Uh, So first, mm -hmm. first of all, any patient who comes to you with a picture of someone else and says, uh, you know, Will I look like this? I think is a complete no. I would probably say you know. Yeah. You know, I would refer. I would refer well, I that think, to Sri John. I think yeah. If I if I had that, yeah. I, I think that is the that's the alarming situation. The moment yes, they yeah. want to look like some somebody yeah. else. Yeah. It's, so it's better um, to stay oh, off. Yeah. I, I never show them. John, what is it? Although I do prediction analysis with photographs yeah. uh, because yeah. we do have software available for that. I never show them to the patient. Okay. Um, I, what I do is I show them my previous patients and say, this is what this patient had, and this is what they looked like. So, you know, you can see that there can be significant changes, uh, but, you know, I can't pr predict exactly what you're going to look like. That's what I tell them. But Anjan, what if you're a newcomer, like a budding surgeon, they don't have anybody previously to show. In yeah. that case, what do they do? <laughs> In that case, so, I, I know, what, is know. Your, what is your advice? So uh, I, I thought I think you have to start by treating patients with low expectations. Don't uh, try uh, to more... treat a patient who has high expectations to start with. At the uh, same time, start with simpler procedures, yes. right? Uh, isolated and genioplasty. Particularly or patients who have functional problems. So patients with functional an open problem. bite, for example, yeah. you know that you know yeah. if you can improve their bite, that's fifty percent of the battle won. Uh, yeah. It doesn't matter if, you know, they don't look perfectly, you know, they, their smile isn't, you know, like what they expected. If you got them a bite, which they didn't yeah. have. So I think yeah. treat patients who have functional problems and don't treat the borderline cases. Don't treat the, you know, very, you know, uh, cosmetically critical patients to start with. The okay. second thing is, yes, as far as the planning, which you mentioned, Anjit, yes, I think the planning does make uh, it more predictable. And I think uh, there are a lot of companies which do 3D planning, and uh, I think there's a sort of a tendency for youngsters to think that, oh, they can give all the information to the planners and they will do the planning for you. No, it's not yeah. like that. And I think, I guess Srijan will probably tell you the same. You know, even when you, do model twice, surgery, you, have to you can't just give the, you can't give the models to your PG and say, okay, do the, do yeah. the, do the, do the model surgery <laughs> and I'll have a look at it on the day of the surgery. No, it, 
it it doesn't work that way it's a disaster yeah. if you do that you need to sit and actually see what the model surgery has been done what has been done so i sit with my pgs even when i was doing model surgery and sit and see where the cuts have been and how they've been moved um yeah. so you know i probably spend as much time doing the model surgery as i do doing the surgery on the patient uh, oh. but that's probably where you know you save time because the virtual surgery is much quicker and it yeah. takes about you know 20 minutes sitting with the designers to say okay these are the movements and i'm happy with it so that's i think the advantage of but you still have to sit and spend that time with the planners you can't expect them to do the movements for you see they will sometimes do movements which you know as a surgeon are you know unrealistic you're not going to be able to do those movements as a surgeon so i think that's something that you have to realize that 3d planning works but it technology in the right hands works but technology in the hands of a monkey is as bad as you know anything okay. else so the, 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 the last thing is the surgery itself yes you know okay. we have to remember that this is cosmetic surgery it's an elective procedure and these are usually young patients if you give them morbidities they're going to last for life uh, yeah. so you know careful analysis and th- things like cbct is really useful because they will tell you where the nerve is and obviously with the infra with the mandible it's usually the nerve which is the biggest you know thing concern that we all have is yeah uh, where is the nerve going to sit uh the other yeah. thing which people sometimes miss out is things like condylar resorption so i have occasionally yeah. patients who yeah. already had condylar resorption it's not been picked up and you know the patients had surgery and now they've got a relapse because they've actually had pmj problems which were undiagnosed so these are things which i think in fact there's a possibility that these patients would be having pmds yes. prior to the surgery right which yeah. needs to be which needs to yeah. be diagnosed yeah. yeah so i think the imaging does help with that Mm-hmm. um but as far as you know reducing your complications um i i guess like any surgery you know uh, the more you do uh, the more the better the you better get at doing the it better you get it. technical procedures and along the lines all of us have had complications and i fresh which we all hide underneath the carpet and uh, show all the all our best results but trijol trijol is going to break that mold now what is your <laughs> take <laughs> what is your take on this i will uh... i will mention i will show a, a little bit of um complications as well means like final okay. result complications um the important point i, I can i can uh, advise to the youngsters is choose the really bad ones first the ones where you can hardly go wrong if there is a huge uh, advanced ma- mandible you you know how to do a psa so it's very likely that you will definitely give a reasonable result so keep the subtle ones for a slightly senior time that helps mm. so okay that that can be one so tip. as as uh, anjan said borderline to be handled later in in your uh, career initially just stick to the functional problems or the ones which have uh, where you can give a distinct outcome between the post and pre so that patient feels satisfied yeah i will actually i will add this one point which i learned directly from professor malcolm harris i used to work for him so it's uh, like he used to divide the mild moderate and severe very very simply rule of 3 3 mm 6 mm and above 6 mm 0 to 3 mm is subtle case try to avoid leave it for the for the best hands 3 to 6 mm you can give very good results um, but those have to be done every surgery has to be done carefully above 6 mm a severe cases there is no doubt about the fact that uh, you're definitely going to provide uh, them with a reasonable result so that's how to choose 0 to 3 probably orthodontics if surgery only by the people who are very experienced the best zone is 3 to 6 mm changes but above 6 is the area where you can play reasonably safe okay only don't get that's very insightful just uh, devascularized that's all Just don't bring them too far away from the from the uh, from the original patient the patient's okay. tissues that's all okay yeah. so do uh, we still don't have any questions here i don't see any more questions uh, so let's proceed to your presentation uh, dr srijan okay yeah do we have any questions or can we proceed okay our next uh, our next 
speaker is Dr. Sri John Mukherjee. He is a highly qualified FDS RCS and FDS RCS from Edinburgh as well as England, FIBUMS. He's currently, uh, his current designation is a director of Calcutta Institute of Maxillofacial Surgery and Research Center. He's a professor in oral and maxillofacial surgery, Rama University of Kansas. Uh, he has several other um, achievements. And as you all know, uh, he's a very good uh, painter, uh, a flautist, and several other interests. So maxillofacial surgery is more of a creative uh, field for him, right? Yeah. And let's see how let's see how an artist sees maxillofacial surgery. Thank you so much, Dr. C. John. Please. Thank you. Thank the you. The stage is all yours. Yeah. yeah. So we'll just. Just one second. Okay, so uh, can you see the screen now? Taranjit? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. So we are going to talk about, I think, I think there's no point um, of any further introduction. We will get directly into business. So we're talking about the orthognathic surgery for the maxilla. As has been discussed already, we must, at the very beginning, be very sure why are we looking at this patient for the surgery? Patient's perception of treatment need. This was where we kind of finished the last discussion where we were talking about choice of the patient. This has to be very clear and that saves you from the problem of uh, complications in terms of patient satisfaction afterwards. We should be very clear about the expectation versus reality dilemma and that should be made uh, completely clear. And we must remember one of those great old sayings, no surgeon ever lost sleep on a surgery he has not done. It probably applies, uh, one of the best places to apply it is uh, orthognathic surgery. We need to decide for maxilla more whether it is at all possible by orthodontics. You can see sometimes when forceful effort to orthodontically camouflage orthognathic cases can, can become a disaster as well. When we're talking maxillary surgery, we must know about one terminology, the hyperactive upper lip. I kind of qualified my post-graduation a long time ago in 2000. It's about, uh, well, it's 21 years. So we didn't uh, know this terminology, hyperactive upper lip very well at the time but I think it has already come into literature enough. Uh, you look at that face over there on the screen, nobody would dare to consider reducing that gummy smile. Um, the point is an hyperactive upper lip can sometimes give, uh, can result in a gummy smile, which can be clinically noted, but we should be extremely careful not to try to impact such maxillae because these are more prominent at younger age and here we, we can be can go very very wrong so remember that this mild moderate severe which we talked before and we must remember before maxillary surgery is that there is an entity called hyperactive upper lip where especially while smiling too much of gum is shown that is almost never a surgical uh, candidate documentation extremely important already talked about uh, by uh, dr anjan Another topic which has already been covered, OPG lateral cephalometry analysis and prediction tracing, a very old fashioned, but uh, I don't think there is, there is any, any replacement of that. To the surgeon, these are the best guides. Now the gray zone lies when we have uh, often have discussions uh, is about what are we targeting? Ideal occlusion or excellent aesthetics? That's to, to make it very clear, we are not orthodontists. We actually do not operate most of the times for ideal occlusion. Sometimes we do help in functional occlusal rehabilitation by orthognathic surgery, but usually we are targeting aesthetics. Now, how does occlusion come in? Of course, I'm not talking about uh, moving jaws and bringing teeth to positions where they cannot bite at all. I'm talking about reasonable occlusion but may not be orthodontically, classically ideal. 
we need to make sure that the occlusion is stable because end of the day occlusion is our permanent retainer a good occlusion if achieved at the end of orthognathic surgery the surgical result will be stable so this is something we have to keep in mind we must give a stable occlusion but uh, we must target primarily at excellent aesthetics as surgeons models and bites when we are operating maxilla the, i have seen uh, with my juniors my students sometimes they they are looking at the anterior posterior dimensions because that is so much more obvious do not forget you have a it's it's a nice idea well um, let me tell you this way i'm i'm addressing people who are just itching to do their next orthognathic surgery they have a patient so i'm just putting in a few advice like you have a checklist of things to note and um, i have noticed that there is a tendency of missing cant and calves the calves of p and whether or not there is a cant has to be recorded and has to be incorporated at the time of surgery why sometimes people get away without making a big note about the cant because if you articulate the model in the proper way the cant correction is incorporated in it we cannot we should not do orthognathic surgeries without splints i do remember um some elderly gentlemen who were like they were great surgeons some of them uh, still operating but those days of uh, saying that i plan my orthognathic surgery and the result at the time of walking down to the operating room i think we are not in those days this is not criticizing anybody but um but if somebody is learning to do good surgery such concepts should be got rid of and it's high time for that you can see that small contraption at the end uh, in the mouth that is a condylar um, condylar repositioning guide for me and even for single jaw maxillary surgeries i do that i will explain it um, at the end why so finally for maxilla there are few surgeries we that the commonest two will be discussed first and third one will be discussed uh, afterwards and finally there is the distraction procedure for maxilla so there are four procedures that we perform on the maxilla and we have to decide which one is the right surgery for maxilla in the given case commonest um, they used to call it marriage osteotomy this is not supposed to be a surgery in an ideal world anterior segmental osteotomy should uh, should hardly be there in our list but in practical uh, scenario we do have to perform a lot of them uh, this is surgical orthodontics the standard procedure i would not mention names in our training pathway names were um, kind of like were well, not that important this um, coopers um, westmund there are so many wonderer there are so many names and so many procedures let us not confuse ourselves and we will just go into the concept of upper maxillary anterior segmental osteotomy where we remove the four four make a cut good enough to expose the whole area but at the same time we must remember that the blood supply is coming from the buccal aspect so we don't extend it too far back and we preserve the mucosal integrity soft tissue integrity periosteal integrity inside those uh, lateral aspects as much as we can because the biggest disaster of this surgery is losing the whole of that segment we try not to disturb the nasal capsule complete the osteotomies mostly with a bar and keep on checking whether it fractures well it gets hinged on the palatal mucosa we must not make we must understand that palatal mucosa is very tenuous it is very well stuck to the bone underneath and that bone is paper thin palate seems to be pretty pretty rigid when we fill it with your finger but when you actually play with the palate you will find that it's extremely thin so it is very easy to damage the palatal mucosa when we are making upward movements primarily upward movements of um, of these these segments so that's the upper and the lower which is commonly called coles procedure is exactly the same again preserving of that thin bridge of soft tissue is the most important part 
and good mobilization is extremely important for all forms of osteotomy mobilization and making sure at every step that you are not trying to push or press down the the fractured fragment because there are, there are small spicules of bone here and there which are probably preventing you so make sure that your final positioning is quite passive and why i have kept cole's procedure here though it is not maxillary osteotomy it is just because most of the time only one jaw only upper jaw because patient comes for the uh, maxillary anterior procline uh, proclined teeth but you cannot push them back if you don't have the lower anteriors pushed downwards because the un uh, partnered unopposed lower anteriors take a pyramidal shape uh, a towering shape upwards and when you try to push the maxillary anteriors back they will prevent you from moving and what you will do is you will tip the maxillary anteriors instead of pushing them backwards so to avoid that if you are envisaging a maxillary anterior segmental push back then always look down if you need a uh, coals as well for pushing the lower segment down the results are uh, are generally good it's a simple easy surgery if done judiciously but most of this require both upper and lower jaw osteotomies i have i have uh, eliminated the eyes of the patients from whom i don't have written permission the others i have uh, left alone because i have got written permission from them for medical purpose uh, use just a few to show what anterior segmental osteotomy look like result wise well some of them require more procedures of course those teeth though they have been pushed back they're not good enough to be left alone like that some dental work needs to be done now it is not well always now what is wrong in this patient the patient is reasonably happy but i am um, quite not so happy and proud to show this case this one because of the nasolabial angle above there this is where you compromise sometimes uh, we have to do um, little bits of compromises i actually uh, didn't probably couldn't move the lower anteriors enough so there has been a bit of a tipping rather than push back or the push back was not adequate the, the, because the maximum space that we have is the space of the first premolars and that space if it is not adequate some tipping comes in and this is what you get so be careful about this uh, even after a piriform plasty sometimes you cannot get a good nasolabial angle towards the acute side you don't get it and uh, and that's a that's a problem it shows however most patients um, are kind of okay with it but uh, you know that something is not perfect obviously we talked about the disasters before and the disasters can only be prevented by being extremely meticulous and delicate about preserving blood supply throughout apart from that it's an easy surgery be extremely kind to the blood supply comes the standard maxillary osteotomy which is what people normally talk about uh, as maxillary osteotomy it's a lafort one advancement and push back the impaction is also there but that is that is all inclusive here follow the basic principles have a view of both sides do not strip unnecessary periosteum it's absolutely unnecessary in most areas protect the nasal capsule the nasal mucosa have the marks can you see the the marks which are which are clearly placed there the two marks that's the distance which has been calculated um, both in the cephalometry as well as at the time of model surgery and all i'm going to do is after after the fracture is completed i'm going to match this lower mark with the mark in front and that will give me the position which was decided not only that uh, the position in anterior posterior but this really helps in also lateral uh, positioning because it should not look angulated they should look like a straight line the commonest area of confusion even to us after um, 
after three figures of maxillary osteotomy is the pterygoid disjunction. I, I'm kind of still old fashioned and do pterygoid dis disjunction perform that in most cases. The pterygoid disjunction is controlled by the opposite hand index finger, which is sitting at the junction, uh, at, at the, just in front of the hamular notch. And um, that finger tells you how you are moving with your uh, pterygoid osteotomy, the typical calf pterygoid osteotomy. It has to be a narrow angle, quite lesser than 45 degrees. And you are trying to tap the lowest part. Before doing this, before going for pterygoid disjunction, go pick up one of those skulls where the pterygoids are intact. And from the front, use your pterygoid osteotomy. You don't have to fracture off the pterygoid, but have the feel of the engagement of the tip. The engagement of the tip should happen pretty low down because higher up, you get into a zone where you are going to make a much bigger fracture, which is unnecessary. And there will be a lot of bleeding and there can be other risk factors as well. Pterygoid disjunction is something we still continue to do. And without a good pterygoid disjunction, it is extremely difficult to mobilize the maxilla. What happens often is the lateral part disjuncts quite easily. There is a little bit of communication in the medial part, which is disjuncted at the time of pyriform osteotomy. When we go, because what uh, youngsters uh, would not have the visualization, three-dimensional visualization very, very clearly. Uh, and we think that kind of the nose is a medial structure and the pterygoid um, area is a lateral structure. It is not that. At the very end, the medial part of the pterygoid junction, pterygomaxillary junction, is right behind the posterior um, uh, pyriform fossa, the posterior opening of the nose on the two sides are guarded by the medial aspect of the pterygoid junction. So when we complete the medial osteotomy, that is the pyriform osteotomy, we reach that the same place. So if the lateral osteotomy was not complete, this should complete it. And at that time, you may or may not get torrential bleed because that is the point down which the greater palatine artery runs. Let us now know that uh, we do not get the main supply of the palate from the greater palatine vessels. But that does not mean that we will intentionally go and kill the vessels. If they're protected, fair enough. If one vessel is gone, and the world is not lost. We can carry on and continue the procedure. Just buzz it off. I am not too good at this. So that's why I have kept primarily the, the pictures from the book, Trimble's Osteotomy, which is osteotomy through the third molar socket area. You remove the remaining bone the tuber of the tuberosity with the nibbler. This is how it looks. And uh, for this, this is the literature available on the net. You can get this one. You see the, you can, you can have a note of it. The pterygoid plate separation in low level. This is only applicable for low level maxillary osteotomies. The original article by Trimble it's a, it's a good read. We can, we can try this. There are other techniques that have come in more recently. This is a 2012 technique where the whole procedure of the osteotomy and the pterygoid disjunction is done from the anterior aspect. As we discussed before, it is all in relation to the pyriform fossa. So that is what they follow. And they go all the way back and do the fracture. I'm not recommending this for youngsters, it's just that you you could have a read of this as well. You can see the name of the of the article. There are different styles and different levels. The cuts go in different different ways, but mostly you have to understand that the lower down you go at the very back, the easier it is to disjunct because there is a point just above the tuberosity where the pterygoids finishes. So you go, for, you dip down as, as you go backwards. You can go for steps. You can go for high level osteotomy. The higher the level of osteotomy, more of soft tissue, uh, soft tissue compensation you get, the better soft tissue profile you get. There's something called quadrangular osteotomies where you can, you can see here, that's the infraorbital foramen. 
and the osteotomy has gone all the way up up to there so that we get a large amount of this is uh, to 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 compensate a huge degree of paranasal hollowing the paranasal hollowing will be gone if you do that some results of uh, lefort 1 advancement maxillary osteotomy almost all are marginally high level because once you are comfortable to drop it at the very back it is best to go as high as possible because uh, you get the full soft tissue to help you you see the features that you look to correct the most important feature is the paranasal hollowing which gives the typical concavity of the face and one feature that you correct um, like kind of voluntarily the patients get an advantage just look at the tip of the nose i didn't touch the nose but the uh, nose tip that was looking all the way down is looking straight as it should and that's a bonus that you get in this surgery again all is not well with the maxillary osteotomies and this is one osteotomy which i rarely do try to avoid as much as we can but we cannot help when there is a vme that is maxillary impaction i searched the literature i couldn't get a clear cut um, guideline of how much for how much what i mean is you must understand it is extremely uh, important to understand that if you are impacting a maxilla vertically then you must push the maxilla back uh, backwards as well because the height of contour of the teeth forms a line which is more convex than the area above the teeth that is i think i think it is pretty clear so the height of contour now will lie at a point if you impact it where normally the apical area of the teeth was supposed to lie that is a depression so the area which was supposed to be depressed now gets convex because you have impacted it that's why you get an ape face if you don't push the whole staff backwards so there is no distinct proportion which has been provided to us say for example if you impact the maxilla 7 mm you must push it back for 3 and 1/2 mm i think somebody can pick it up as a as a research topic to uh, to chase so be very careful about maxillary impactions you can do a perfect job but you can have an unhappy patient and unhappy you what am i doing there you do a perfect maxillary procedure impaction push back everything is good you get a excellent lateral cephalometry but everybody is unhappy because the nose is twisted to one side the nose gets twisted because the cartilage cartilaginous part of the septum doesn't get enough room to stand it gets deviated to one side so trimming off the caudal end of the cartilaginous septum one minute procedure is a one minute rhinoplasty that will give you a real uh, peace of mind and a happy patient you should know about cinching and you have to actually what you do is you keep on holding tissues from inside in the raw area because a direct marker is not very easily available keep pulling and see at which pull the real outside end point of the ela which is touching the skin when that point is coming inward so that is the part of the fiber because that is not a cartilage that is a typical fibrous tissue so now you have clenched it suture it with a thick proline i use 2o or 3o and um, because it is going to stay for quite long time after which the fibers will probably take over about vui closure which is very common in uh, in maxillary osteotomies we must understand that we we are not in a target of giving anybody a bird big upper lip so a maximum about of about 3 stitches are what you put in the vertical limb of the y and uh, if you require more than that then you have to do w plasties but remember one thing this is not a fantastic way of lengthening up a lip because it will scar and the lip will go back pretty close to where you started so don't depend on this as the main way of uh, lengthening up a lip 
you must have your anesthetist comfortable in changing of tube from nasal to oral when you are doing a maxillary osteotomy because the final steps of cinching and uh, and and closure may require a proper shaped nose and upper lip area which uh, which cannot happen if the tube is coming out through the nose this is a risky procedure you need a good anesthetist to be happy in a bloody mouth to perform a shift over from nasal to oral intubation condyle position as we mentioned simple thing have two points where which will not be interfered with why even for maxillary osteotomy you need to be sure about condyle position is because sometimes we actually push on the mandible to get the teeth into the splint and uh, we are actually pushing the mandible into the into the fossa and that's where we are fixing the maxilla based on that position of, uh, on the splint so when you finish the surgery and and take the imf off you will find that the patient has ended up with the open bite so be careful about condyle position and do, do do not achieve anything by pressure on the mandible your mandible should be passively sitting into the splint triple and quadruple procedures are parts of maxillary osteotomy we have already discussed bilateral sagittal split osteotomy in detail so this is just another situation you have to be aware about that many a times you you have, you have to know where where to divide your surgery into two jaws it's not just based on uh, based on the actual value remember again uh, one of those uh, points from the boss that if there are there are two movements the advancement movement should be more because anything you push back gives you a flatter face anything you pull out gives you a more prominent face and everybody is out there looking for a prominent face so if we are moving 1 cm give the maxilla 6 mm advancement and the mandible 4 mm push back so that that's the that's the crux management of anterior open bite bad ones are a big challenge a quadruple procedure is required maxillary la fort one uh, anterior segmental mandibular uh, bsso and anterior segmental unless you have a fantastic orthodontist who eliminates the first part so four splints the la fort one osteotomy this is pretty low level because it is for a different purpose and here low level is required because we are going to perform the anterior segmental osteotomy from this direction from above so everything has been put together in the maxilla mandible coles and bsso to follow and we get a closed mouth in the anterior open bite next part is distraction osteogenesis distraction gives us a lot we do it in very hypoplastic maxilla needing 8 mm or more because uh, beyond that the maxilla is very stubborn you cannot pull a maxilla forward beyond a certain point in cleft hypoplasias because of the scarring which is again very stubborn in syndromes like the one you saw before and in un some untreated traumatic malunited maxilla because here the same scar like the cleft will be there behind the maxilla we have already discussed about uh, distraction osteogenesis we will not go too far in detail i will uh, advise strongly if it if it is feasible by time and money having a pre adapted maxillary distractor system is extremely extremely helpful especially in cleft situations because there the bone is unpredictable you may get bone which uh, which will betray you on the spot and um, manipulating the distractors inside the operating theater inside tissue requires bigger exposure and it is very very fiddly so when you pre adapt and go in it makes life much much easier operating operating time is reduced to half and that is from experience so you just require a 3d model which is pretty easily available nowadays be careful about collapsing palate and differential movement of the two parts of the palate in cleft maxilla and uh, forward distraction 
never trust the alveolar bone graft in this respect it is a uh, half filled glass so it is uh, it is not half full it is half empty when you are using the alveolar bone as the only holding material between the two sides of uh, of the palate they just melt away after the first few days of distraction so these kind of devices are prepared by my orthodontic colleague um, to hold on to the palate in position throughout the process of distraction and finally sometimes you may put in a horizontal plate as well not fantastic thing but uh, it, it helps i will just go fast incision and exposure remember the distractor adaptation is an art if you do that in in vitro i think yeah outside that is on a on a model it's very much easier checks at placement most important check is the parallelism of the two distractors osteotomy cuts i put the anterior part of the cut with the distractor in situ because sometimes after you remove the distractor and put your cut the thin line of bone around the screw hole becomes a little weaker and a fracture line can move into that hole after removing the distractor you complete the osteotomy mobilize well passive uh, reseating of the distractor should be strictly practiced it shouldn't be active check activation good enough closure you, you cannot close water tight remember that don't feel uncomfortable if you cannot close a distracted area water tight you just should keep it close enough so that it doesn't get dirty you must be aware of the different sizes and what are the problems that the patient can have like look here the amount of distraction that i need for in this patient requires a distractor which will not be not be contained in the mouth what can i do so in such situations you have to be ready to talk uh, around sticky questions you must know the vast range of distractors available and that some distractors can be used in splints rather than in bone if the bone is not good enough the lower end that i am talking about remember all distractors don't give 20 mm in 40 turns and distractors are not unbreakable a broken distractor distractors pretty easily and they can break while uh, procedure is going on so have have your mind set that way it's not one of those extremely sturdy stuff like the extra oral distractors and distraction is a three dimensional movement but the plannings uh, the millimeter plannings are in two dimensions so there is a vector component which might reduce your total movement forward so remember that when you are distracting so don't be very stubborn at stopping the distraction on the on the very moment that you have reached your planned movement look at the occlusion and decide i strongly believe a distractor is not a very good uh, device at completing osteotomies your osteotomy must be complete i have proponent who of uh, no pterygoid disjunction required etc in cases of distraction but personally i have not been very successful in completing osteotomies with distractor so i cannot recommend that have very a very satisfactory osteotomy and uh, and mobilization of the segment before you trust your distractor to work when you are working with a hypoplastic maxilla which is most often the case for distraction you must remember the hypoplastic maxillary bone is thinner and weaker than normal so the cuts fracturing during the cutting and uh, the drill holes not working very well not uh, not being very obedient are problems with distraction remember that there is something called a coronoid process that whose area we are encroaching into when we are placing intraoral maxillary distractors so throughout the procedure move your mandible from time to time to make sure that in this process it will not be affected distractor removal is a clumsy procedure and uh, general anesthesia is often required do not try intraoral maxillary distractor removal under local anesthetic 
because the upper part by the time you have completed the distraction the upper uh, part of the distractor assembly has gone far away backwards so it will be very difficult for you because the anterior part has moved forward good bone is great but it is not an infallible truth sometimes the bone may not be that great um, due to scar tissue and all sorts so when in doubt do plate even after your distraction just a few cases of distraction osteosynthesis so this is how it should go you see here you see a single this is an indian distractor basic distractor you see the two distractors are placed but you can actually see only one line of the cylinders <laughs> that's very important because that confirms parallelism some distraction cases cleft distraction another major distraction here when we are envisaging maxillofacial orthognathic surgery adjuvant procedures must be kept in mind genioplasty is bits of rhinoplasty and obviously the most common adjuvant to maxillary surgery is mandibular surgery malars become very important this is a malar graft but here comes our last part lafort 3 advancement osteotomy of maxilla is not as complicated as it sounds it should be done more often it is not done as often um, uh, as it should be this is the procedure where you get the whole of the mid face um, forward and you see the show of the white of the eye has reduced as well the whole face changes the character changes that's about the line you use a transconjunctival approach with a lateral canthotomy and this is a bit more of a lateral canthotomy than usual so that's a procedure going on below you see the two types of uh, maxillary osteotomy and the second type is what we follow cuffness modification you expose the orbital rim and these are the two cuts the medial and the lateral cut i've seen the medial cut before as we as we have shown here just have a look at those uh, skull line drawings that's a medial cut you see the top of the medial cut in the medial aspect and the lateral cut there the lateral cut looks like this uh, of an inverted l which goes all the way down and the lowermost part can be done from intraoral approach so here the eye is protected and you can see the cut inside the orbit on the orbital floor which goes laterally to meet the inferior orbital fissure so these are the to total cuts the medial we, we separate the septum as usual uh, for maximum autotomy a vertical incision the level of the zygomatico alveolar crest area this here it, it is much easier than the usual pterygoid osteotomy because you you just put one vertical incision and as all the tissues are intact the blood supply is never an issue here and you directly enter the pterygo um, pterygoid junction and complete the cut upwards be very careful at the top you might leave the very end because here you are exiting through the inferior orbital fissure you remember above you touch the inferior uh, inferior orbital fissure from the orbital floor side here you are touching it from the inferior aspect from the maxilla intraoral side and then you complete the mobilization you see that it's it's completely completely free you have got abundant space you can bring it down bring it forward move it wherever you want and by the way lafort 3 is never done for pushbacks it's only done for bringing forward so this gap as you can understand it can be as much as you want you see the degree to which you can create a gap remember to give it a pull for a length of time because the 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 pterygoids immediately goes into spasm after this uh, fractures so they will first not yield much so your movement will be restricted give it a pull for a little while and then go for imf into your prefabricated splint 
From beforehand, you have a supply of good juicy bone from Ilia Crest. Nice diced pieces go in there. And you can also put a little bit at the pterygoid areas. That's the first day post-op, sixth week post-op, before and after. That covers maxillary osteotomy for you now. Thank you. Dr. Anjin, you're still there? Yes, yeah, I'm still there, yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you want to add anything to this, Dr. Anjin? What is your experience with LIPO3? I still oh, no, don't I think, have any uh, questions from the participants. The maxilla pretty well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions from the audience? I don't see anything. What is your experience with complications, Dr. Srijan? Complications of what? Which one specifically? Of maxillary. I mean, let's start with the simpler one, like LIFO one. In which situations can somebody get into a complication? or a compli And if you do, then what do you do? Do you just, you know? See, the commonest complication, the, as, we, as we all know how to answer questions in an exam, Complications yeah. are uh, of three types primarily. First is we cannot make the disaster of a, a bad judgment about our surgery where we, what, what surgery we perform. So let us keep that aside. Let us consider that we have done a good judgment and we are going into the surgery. So power operative complications are majorly the main complications in maxillary osteotomies. Unlike mandibular where post-operative complications are also uh, pretty, pretty much more. Here, bleeding is a well-known complication yeah. because mm -hmm. of the blood supply of the pterygoid plexus and the maxillary arteries all at the, just behind the area of our work. Very fortunately for us, most of these bleedings stop very well by packing. And Wonderful. Mm -hmm. packing is a, is a patient's game. You pack it, uh, you see, I, I have the bad habit of smoking. So I'm just sorry, I'm mentioning it. What I do is, if I ever get into a bleeding in that area, I would actually, I've got fantastic team of juniors. They would just pack the area with a pause soaked big mop or big lumps of gauze. They would keep a pressure and I will unscrub, go out, do the, the uh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, well, and then come back. So I'm giving about 10 minutes plus to the area, so I will really scrub okay. and come in. So, it's a get so do not be in a hurry to remove your pack. Yes. Wait sufficiently. Mm. It, it is very common in the operating theater when uh, we are packing for a bleeding, we don't even realize that it's just been a minute or minute and a half and we always just, just bring things out and check what is going on. So in this area, bleeding control is time uh, related, time sensitive. And once you get the pack out, you will either find that the bleeding has completely ceased or you will identify a small part where the sparter is coming from. It will mostly okay. be the greater palatine. So okay. as we discussed yes. before, the greater palatine can be completely buzzed off. Um, so that is one problem. The other thing is bad fractures, like the splat in uh, BSSO. Yes. Maxilla, especially hypoplastic maxilla, when I use a spreader, a carved bilateral, two cow spreaders to fracture down the maxilla. Now, even though the, these spreaders are much thinner than the uh, wide spreaders, wide speed spreaders, even then they can sometimes fracture off the most important buttress area bone, which is our main bone on which we depend for the fixation. So with time you learn that it is very, very important. So don't be impatient of the drown, down fracture. As soon as you try, fractured, try, try to fracture it, and you find that something is uh, with a very limited yeah. controlled pressure, you cannot fracture, just take your instrument out, revisit the cuts. Always and every time, do not try to fracture with brute force. That is the recipe for disaster. These things should behave as if they were just keen to get fractured. 
Only then you can I think these are basic principles of surgery that we need to remember in every surgery, right? First, you have to identify the anatomical structures that we are dealing with. So that identification has to be clear. And then do not put brute force, identify, you know, have patience. These are basic surgical principles, which we even use for simple things like impactions and yeah. minor surgery. So one small point here. to add, uh, if you have the, um, the luxury of using sophisticated, the good uh, plating system, like I, I also use, I will not use the names, but the leading international brands that are available here, they all have got self-drilling screws. Yeah. In axillary mm -hmm. procedure, if you are not too happy with the bone, then you can use in the complex, difficult areas, you can use self-drilling uh, screws because what happens when you drill a hole in a very oblique way in soft and thin bone, you're very likely to make a hole too big for the screw yeah. to uh, go in. That, that we see even in trauma also, mid-phase trauma that happens all the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, if you are, if you are, uh, uh, if you this kind of good materials are available, good plates and screw system are available, do ask the people to supply with a few self drilling screws. And in areas where you are not getting very good access, use these screws rather than um, the drilled ones. Yes. Dr. Anjan, don't you think that in this uh, uh, mucor mycosis situation, we have been exposing a lot of maxilla and, you know, seeing it. There was a time when I started doing osteotomies for the dead maxilla and, you know, get a hang of it. Yeah, it was tragic, but a place where, you know, people, the beginners could get the hang of oh, osteotomies. Yeah. If you have someone yeah. who's got a bilateral mucormycosis, I think that's yeah. the easiest, that's the easiest way to of learn. That's right? what, yeah. that's what we have been Unfortunate doing. for the patient, but I know a good yeah. learning tool. I it's know. a good learning place for somebody who wants to... Yeah, that's what I said. So what do we do? We still, we are still waiting. Is so, there anything uh, else? One, one of the points. So uh, uh, maybe if I could. Uh, so um, uh, as far as the maxilla, the, the thing which I've commonly seen, especially beginners do, uh, where they make a mistake is particularly for an open bite, not removing enough posterior maxillary bone. So when you're uh, uh, clo closing an open bite. Uh, it's very important that you have to remove posterior maxillary bone. You cannot pull the maxilla down. You can't pull the, rotate the mandible to close and open, but you have to remove posterior maxillary bone. And like Srijan said, you know, we're all worried about bleeding from the greater palatine artery, but, you know, we learn with experience and like Srijan and me, we would just buzz the greater palatine artery. And then you can freely remove bone in the posterior maxilla. Uh, and I think that's often a common beginner's mistake. They don't remove enough bone. And then when you try to do your IMF, you tend to pull the condyle out and you fix the maxilla. You think everything is fine. The occlusion is great. And the patient wakes up and they still have an open bite. Uh, so I think that's just one point that removing posterior maxillary bone, I think, is uh, very important. Absolutely. They say a uh, uh, big terminology, very important terminology is the pterygo maxillary sling does not yield. So it cannot be lengthened in a procedure, unless you are doing a distraction. In osteotomy, the pterygo maxillary sling cannot be lengthened. So rotating a mandible upwards, like waging it forward to rotate, it, it means you are pulling the pterygo maxillary sling to make it long. It does not get long and it will open up the bite. Uh, so posterior maxilla reduction is the key to, uh, to open bite closure. In any form of uh, procedure, where you want the chin to come forward, the mandible to rotate forward, the, the key lies in the posterior maxilla. Mm. I'm afraid I can't comment much on that because my experience with automatic surgery is very limited. And I, I, I cannot comment on behalf of my attendees today, but I have learned a lot from you both guys. Thank you so much for such yeah. an amazing presentation. Thank you very much. I guess I don't see much and we all have to rush for the um, mucormycosis webinar. Yes, uh, Dr. Anjan? Thank yeah, you no, so much. I think I've learned a lot, especially the, about lipotry yeah. osteotomies. Maybe I will try yeah. it now after seeing Shijan. I, I feel highly one. inspired, Dr. Shijan yes. and Dr. Anjan. <laughs> I feel highly inspired to do 
something uh, real. And tell me something, Dr. Pijan. Do you use a saw or uh, do you use simple? No, I don't uh, have a saw. I'm a poor surgeon. Wow. <laughs> wow. Normal drills. <laughs> That's amazing. Great. <laughs> Fine. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. We're looking forward to okay. seeing you more in forthcoming seminars. The coming seminars will be mainly directed towards understanding new core mitosis uh, in a more okay. Thank uh, you significant very much. way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. See you. Thank you.